Good evening, everybody. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, my name is Lieutenant Commander Michael Royal. Uh, it is my honor um, as of this moment to be the commanding officer of the Sea Cadets offshore ship TS Jack Petchy. Um, got about 10 and a half years in the Navy so far and uh, no reason to leave just yet because I'm finding it to be an excellent career and hopefully I can explain a little bit uh, about it, uh, about my experience so far in the Navy uh, and a little bit about careers that might be open to you in the future, uh, particularly in the warfare branch. So I'm just going to see if I can share my screen. Is that coming up? Yeah, that's perfect. Yeah. Amazing. So uh, this is uh, going to be the scope of my brief, the contents of my brief. Uh, just, I'm not going to take forever talking about me because uh, it's always more interesting talking about yourself. But for for you guys listening, uh, it's not going to be as exciting to to listen to me talk about my uh, about myself for forever. So it's just to give you a little bit of context about uh, where I've come from in my career, what I've done. Um, just so you can sort of inform your own decisions about, about this brief and my experience. I'm then going to move on to describe a little bit about the warfare branch itself. Uh, you may know that there are several other branches in the Royal Navy that you can join. Uh, engineering, uh, there are three different types of engineering. There's, there's uh, marine engineering, weapons engineering and air engineering. Uh, and similar transitions from the surface fleet into the subsurface fleet as well. So if you want to be a, a submarine engineer, that's got its own kind of like uh, branch as well. Uh, logisticians have a branch uh, uh, so they keep, keep us fed and keep the stores moving around. Um, and there are many other kind of branches and sub branches available as well. Uh, but for, just for this evening, I'll be talking about the warfare branch. Warfare has sub-specializations as well, which you may uh, recognize from your cadet career so far. So I'll be talking a bit about the options available there and what they do. And there's different ways to, to join the Navy. Um, so whether you want to be a rating or an officer. Uh, so I'll be talking about the entry requirements for those two uh, and basic training. So your first sort of couple of years of when you join up uh, in the service, uh, what, you might, what you might expect. And towards the end, uh, we'll have a look at what the Royal Navy can offer you in general, uh, regardless of what you join as, uh, what uh, we call it the offer uh, in simple terms. So what the Navy can offer you. And then towards the end, uh, uh, we'll be looking for any questions. So this is me. Um, there's my mug on the left hand side in the picture there. That's, uh, that picture was taken uh, off Iceland uh, a number of years ago uh, after a brief stop in the capital Reykjavik. Uh, some key stats and uh, just want to bring your attention to the list of countries on the right hand side. Um, that's the list of all the countries I've been very, very lucky to visit uh, during my 10 year career uh, so far. Um, some of them a little bit obscure, uh, Sri Lanka, for instance, or Easter Island, you may never have heard of. And some of them uh, a little bit more obvious, like Belgium or France or the Netherlands. Um, I will point out that I have been very, very lucky and I try to be modest about it, but uh, I'm very pleased uh, to have visited all these different countries. Um, some of my colleagues who've been in for a similar uh, length of time uh, might have not uh, visited half of the amount of countries that I have. It's all part of the luck of the draw uh, when you join up as to which ships you join, what operations you go to um, and, and what you choose to pursue. There's a number of different options that you can pursue, whether it's sports or adventurous training, etc. And sometimes uh, that's up to you and sometimes uh, you get told what you're going to do. Some key stats in the middle. I joined directly as an officer in February 2013 at the age of 25. Uh, that's quite late. Uh, for a warfare officer. Most officers join at about 21 or 22. Um, some of my colleagues joined at 18 or 19. So that, that gives you an idea of, uh, you know, it doesn't matter if you don't have uh, any idea of what you want to do straight away when you leave school or as you're coming up towards the end of school. You can uh, think about it for a few years, maybe go and work in industry or go traveling, etc. Go to go to university. Um, at the time when I joined up, 25 was the upper age limit which meant that um, that was the latest I could have joined, but they have since removed that limit and it's now increased, I think to 35 or even 40 for some, uh, for some areas of the Navy. So don't feel like you have to have uh, a plan in school of what you want to do. Someone once told me the most interesting people in the world, are people who are 40 years old and still don't know what they want to do. 
So if you if you know what you want to do and you're 15, 16 years old, brilliant, pursue it. If you can get paid to do something you enjoy, that's even better. But if you're not sure, just do what you enjoy and surely something will come your way and you can decide what to do later on. Uh, my proudest moment was after several years of trying hard, I was command qualified and I got to a position uh, where I took what we call conduct. It's basically being the acting captain of a ship and I'll, uh, I'll talk about that later on. And something I really want to uh, draw your attention to is Christmas is away. Um, I'll be focusing on a lot of what's amazing about the Navy and what's really, really good. But it is really important to bear in mind in the back of your mind um, that you will be spending time away. And some people love that. Uh, some people find it amazing that they get to go away and travel the world. And for some people, it's a bit more difficult. And you can see there, I spent four Christmases away from my family in 2022. That was unexpected. I was supposed to be at home in the UK, but I was called up at the last minute to go to Antarctica. Um, I had massive plans of staying at home with my family, but I was called away at the last minute. So it's always a possibility. And some people accept it and some people find it more difficult, like I said. Towards the bottom, uh, those are the classes of ships uh, that I've served in, um, in order. So Type 45 destroyer, really, really big, really spacious, excellent ships, particularly now that they've started to resolve the issues of the, with the uh, power generation and propulsion. Uh, and you can see uh, quite a few ships that I've served in all the way up to my current command, which is TS Jack Petchy. I was selected for um, and I started last June. I thought I would supply some pictures of me actually being at work uh, just to prove that I have done stuff. Uh, the biggest photo on the right hand side uh, was when I was called away for Christmas and New Year last year. Uh, we were in South Georgia and into Antarctica doing some work. Uh, I was with HMS Protector and some penguins at the back of the photo. I never thought I'd ever see penguins, but there you are. Uh, lots and lots of different types of penguins, glaciers, icebergs, etc. Top left, uh, the gentleman with the binoculars is me. Uh, that's me in charge of the bridge on operations in the Middle East uh, in HMS Montrose, which is a frigate now since decommissioned. Um, at a young age, I was in charge of the bridge and responsible only to the captain. Nobody else could tell me what to do apart from the captain. And you could be doing that at the age of 19 or 20, which is a massive responsibility and a massive privilege and a real thrill to do. Bottom left uh, is when I was away uh, for Christmas in Protector and then I was, there I am in the galley helping out and prepare some food. The officers at Christmas time help in the galley and we serve the ratings, which is the opposite way around. And the next photo, uh, there's me and all, all my friends. Uh, my uh, colleague, Zach, was away for the day and we'd managed to rummage around in his stores and find some swanky new folders and we thought it'd be a great idea to take a picture and send it to him because it would have really annoyed him. <laughs> This is my proudest moment, um, as I mentioned earlier on, taking conduct. So it's a sort of command. You tend to, uh, you tend to do it when the captain needs to go away. Uh, and in this case, the island that you can see in the photos, that's Pitcairn Island, about as remote as you can get in the, in the world. Uh, it's in the Pacific Ocean, thousands and thousands of miles away from anywhere else. There's only about 60 people live on the island and they, uh, they rely on supply ships that come every month or six weeks uh, to supply them uh, with everything that they need to live. The Royal Navy likes to send a ship out there every now and then. Now, I was command qualified at this point and I'd uh, worked uh, a long time to get that command qualification and the captain had to step ashore and that left me in charge of the ship uh, whilst she stepped ashore. And typically, a half an hour after she left, an incident happened that I had to deal with. And so I was sat in the captain's chair uh, dealing with that incident and people were answering to me. If anybody's a fan of seamanship and uh, uh, knows their flag hoists, they'll notice in the top right of that slide is a flag hoist, uh, which says DESIG, second sub. And that means that someone other than the captain is, uh, is in charge of the ship. That flag hoist was for me. And I, that was a massively proud moment for me because I've worked for a number of years and you can only raise that flag hoist uh, when you're entitled to do so. The captain was away and that flag hoist was telling everyone that I was in charge. So um, what is the warfare branch? I've told you a bit about my career as an officer and I'm going to uh, give you a flavor now uh, of what the warfare branch is uh, overall. And uh, whatever the mission, and there's always a mission and everyone's involved, regardless of whether you're a ship or a training establishment, there's always a mission. 
logistics give us what we need so they'll give us food they'll give us supplies parts etc to keep us going uh, the engineers use those suppliers to keep us going keep the engines working make sure the lights are switched on make sure the galley's working so we can all get fed but warfare makes it happen it all comes down to the warfare branch and uh, if we didn't have a warfare branch we wouldn't go to sea because the engineers would have the engines working the logisticians would have lunch on the table but there will be no one to actually get the ship to where we need to go and what the warfare branch encompasses a whole raft of different things all the way through from operating weapons to protecting the ship driving boats watch keeping on the bridge and planning missions. Now, uh, crucially, planning missions also uh, could mean finding the enemy. And you could take the enemy literally as in you need to find a bad guy uh, who needs to be taken care of. But you could also substitute that word for anything, whereas you know, the enemy could be a, a mission or a place you need to get to or um, something you need to do. Uh, and it's all about operating the ship um, to make sure that we can get to where we go to, uh, where we need to go to, so that we can do the mission that Navy HQ and the government ultimately has told us to do. There are several sub-specializations, as I mentioned earlier on. Um, you join the warfare branch, but you will sub-specialize. Uh, you can't just be a, a warfare rating or a warfare officer. You have to sub-specialize. Now, for officers, there's a whole number of different things. My specialization is a navigator. Um, I tried everything I could do to avoid becoming a navigator um, because from the outside, it looked like it was an awful thing to do. Why on earth would you subject yourself to that sort of pressure? And actually, having come through the other side is one of the best jobs uh, I've ever done. For ratings, um, there are five that I've picked. I think there are one or two which I've missed, uh, which uh, apply to the mine warfare branch. But just looking at these five here, uh, above water tactical AWTs. Uh, you'll be working in the ops room as an AWT, developing the tactical picture, using the state of the art sensors on board the ship in order to provide command with all the information that, that you have and provide key tactical information. It's the AWT branch that work closely with command in order to form a picture and then develop a plan from that picture, taking in all the information from the sensors and the other sub-specializations in order to develop that plan. Working alongside the AWTs would be electronic warfare, the EWs, which is the middle way down the list. So on the one hand, uh, they are anti-ship missile defense experts. They'll have a look at emission. We, we have uh, equipment that can have a look at radar emissions or other information um, over the horizon that you can't see that you, that you need equipment to detect. Um, so they'll be looking at all that information and be able to identify some of those as missiles that are coming in uh, towards your ship or towards a friendly ship in the area. And they'll be able to develop a defense uh, against those missiles. It's a very, very highly specialized subspecialization and it takes uh, some very intelligent people in order to do it. On the other hand, they're developing intelligence in the battle space. And what do I mean that by that? There's a, a lot of complicated words in one sentence. So what they're doing is looking at a number of different sources, whether it's by looking at um, things like BBC News or whatever the local news channel is in the area and combining that with, the, uh, with things that are allies and other assets in the area. So other ships, helicopters, um, planes, people on the ground, sea boats, ships, etc., satellites, combining all that information together and making sense of it. Um, what is actually going on? What can I see on my screen here? I've got 20 different pieces of information. They're all saying something slightly different. What is actually going on? So they work in conjunction with the AWTs. The EWs and the AWTs work together to develop that picture. Now, ultimately, it's, uh, it's going to come to a time when you need to protect the ship itself or protect someone else, maybe our allies or another ship. And that comes down to the above water warfare weapons specialists or AWWs. 
So they protect the ships using the weapons uh, that we have on board. And it depends what type of ship it is as to what weapons it is uh, available to them. If it's a big ship uh, like a Type 45 destroyer, there's a number of missiles available uh, or the main 4-5 gun, the big gun that you can see the, on the front of our ships, uh, all the way down to smaller weapons like general purpose machine guns or slightly bigger ones like the 50 cal heavy machine gun. The AWWs are also responsible for training uh, sailors and officers in uh, smaller caliber weapons like the rifle or pistols, which some of you might have been lucky enough to go, uh, go, and, go and fire on a range. They tend to be also members of the boarding team. Um, I was a member of a boarding team as well once as a boarding officer, and I had AWW ratings in my team to protect me as I went on board uh, a, a suspect vessel to have search for it, uh, search the vessel for drugs on board. Moving towards uh, the bottom of the text then and the right hand sides, uh, you UWs, uh, underwater warfare. Really, really important people, these submarines are what they're after, and they are experts at, uh, at hunting for submarines. Um, the main piece of equipment that they use is called a sonar, uh, and it uses pulses of energy that get reflected back into their equipment. If you've seen any submarine films like U-571, uh, for instance, you can, you can hear the pulses that they use that bounce off the hulls of the submarines. The equipment that they have in the operations room will be able to detect the range of those submarines and then we can find out hopefully what type of submarine it is as well by listening to it. There's a really good documentary on the BBC fairly recently uh, following I think it was HMS Northumberland um, around uh, the North Sea and the, around the UK on anti-submarine warfare duties so if you're interested in that that's a good documentary to watch. I spoke with the captain uh, just over a year ago. Uh, he came in to lecture us, um, and uh, it's a really, really informative, um, in, informative chat, and a very nice guy. At the bottom of the list, seamen specialists. These are really important people as well. They, uh, they, um, they are your typical seamen, as you would know it. So you uh, would be practicing seamanship skills as part of your cadet career. Uh, they do very, very similar things. So if you imagine back in the day of sailing ships, you needed to anchor or you need to trim the sails or you needed to do stuff on deck, it would be the seamen specialist that would be doing that. Back in the day of sailing ships, most sailors were seamen specialists to begin with. So those are the modern versions uh, of the seamen specialists that we have on board. Uh, they are signaling experts. They can signal in Morse code uh, using flashing lights um, between uh, ships across a number of miles. Uh, they can signal using flags as well. Uh, they're experts at berthing the ship and unberthing the ship, anchoring. Uh, and they also drive our boats as well, uh, which is really important skill to have because that means we can go into places that a ship can't go. Uh, we can send uh, a small boat instead of uh, Pacific 24. Like I said, I think there are other sub-specializations I've missed to do with the mine warfare uh, department, which I don't know very much about. If you remember from the, uh, from the ships I've served in screen a few screens ago, you'll see that I haven't served in any mine hunters, but I roughly know what they do. So if there are any questions at the end, I might be able to tell you something about them. For all these sub-specializations, you don't need any qualifications. Um, you need um, basically a decent aptitude, and I'm going to come onto it in a different uh, different screen. You need to be able to um, pass a series of tests, but it's not like you need a degree or a master's or anything like that. You can join the Navy uh, after leaving school uh, as long as you pass those tests. And the starting salary is pretty reasonable as well. Um, I think that number is slightly out of date now, having, uh, having looked at it, £20,000. I think the starting salary is now £23,000, which isn't bad, really, because if you've just left school and you go into this as your first job, £23,000 a year isn't bad at all. And it climbs fairly rapidly, too. So if you wanted to join up as a rating, as a warfare specialist, uh, this is roughly what they're after. So like I said, no um, specific qualifications. You just need to complete a recruit test at the Armed Forces Career Office. Uh, you'll need to pass a medical and an eye test and uh, pass a fitness test as well. 
And none of those things are difficult. The only things that you don't really have any control over are the medical and the eye tests. Because if you've got something medically wrong with you, or maybe you're colorblind, for instance, there's not a lot you can do about that. But there might be other jobs that the Navy is willing to offer you. Um, for instance, I can't be colorblind as a warfare officer because I need to be able to keep watches on the bridge. And one of the things I need to be able to see are port and starboard lateral marks and port and starboard side lights, which are red and green. Uh, if you've been offshore uh, in one of our ships, you'll know that because we teach you uh, early doors early on in the week. So I can't be colorblind because I need to be able to see those. But for instance, if I wanted to do a different job, there might be other jobs open to me if I was colorblind. Towards the bottom then, if you did join up, uh, you would get seven weeks um, paid holiday per year. Now that absolutely depends on what the ship is doing or what your training establishment is doing. A lot of places have what we call core leave. So it's what you would imagine uh, your holidays to be when you were in school. Christmas, Easter and summer would be classed as core leave. But quite a few times I've been in ships where uh, we have to do what we call offset our leave. So we would have, instead of having August summer holiday, we might have July or September summer holiday. But we will always make sure that our sailors have the leave and the holiday that they need to go home and spend time with their family or just get off the ship and do whatever they need to do. You'll also have access to sports facilities and uh, we aim to get you through uh, learning throughout your career. So whether it's you want to do extra training like GCSEs or A-levels, etc. The bottom one is very interesting. Additional pay for time at sea. Now, you would have thought you join the Navy, you want to be at sea. Um, so why should you get paid extra? Um, but the more time you spend at sea, the more extra pay you get. It starts off at about four pounds per day and it goes up to a maximum of about 30 pounds per day. Now, you can imagine if you spend two or three months away at sea on a deployment on 30 pounds per day extra, that's a lot of extra money. And a lot of people use it for uh, deposits for a house or a new car, new television, etc. You don't need any GCSEs. All you have to do is pass those initial tests. What you can expect to do for your first couple of years uh, is pretty much the same for everyone. As a rating, you'll join up and you'll do 10 weeks at HMS Rally uh, in Cornwall. A lot of you might have been there on summer camps or other courses. And uh, during your 10th week, you'll do a lot of drill, a lot of marching, and you'll pass out as a rating in the Royal Navy. You'll then move on to 12 weeks of what we call phase two training so your basic training is the same for everyone they all do the same basic training and then depending on what you join as whether it's a logistician uh, you know a chef or uh, uh, catering services or maybe you join as a weapon engineer for instance phase two training is different for all of those specializations so for phase two, for warfare specialists, you'll uh, go to HMS Collingwood in Hampshire and you'll do 12 weeks of phase two training. At that point, uh, you're then fit to join the fleet and your rating will be Able Seaman 2, Able Seaman Grade 2. You then need to go to sea to prove your skills and put your skills into practice. There's no point doing three months worth of training and not proving your skills and putting your skills into practice. So you spend your first few months on board a ship working towards a task book and there's a lot of things you have to do is so you have to participate in exercises or you have to train up and do uh, firefighting or damage control or anchoring or whatever is in your task book. And once you've completed that task book, which normally takes three or four months, you'll then be rated up as able seaman grade one or AB1. And that's when you've completed your basic professional training. Now, it's not that someone just throws that badge across the table at you and you've put a lot of work into that. You might have you might have put a year or two's work into it before you get your AB1 badge. So what I like to do when I'm in Jack Petchy and we're at the end of a voyage and the cadets have completed their week, I like to present them with their qualifications at the end of the week. They'll come up to me, they'll salute me, shake my hand uh, and I'll give them a certificate and their badge. 
Very similar in the Royal Navy, uh, when you get your Able Seaman 1 badge. Uh, you'll meet the captain. You have to request permission to, to, to ship your new rate. So you can't just put Able Seaman Grade 1 on your shoulder um, uh, or on your arm. Uh, you have to request permission to see the captain who will review the evidence and then uh, formally uh, present you a new badge and congratulate you on your effort. And then throughout your career, after that initial professional training is done, uh, you'll continue your professional development. Now, some sailors are absolutely fine at Able Seaman 1. No problem at all. They'll spend 20 years in the Navy uh, at Able Seaman 1. But most people like to progress. And the next rating you'll be aiming for after Able Seaman 1 will be leading hand. Um, that normally takes a couple of years and you'll be expected to be able to lead a small group of sailors, say three or four uh, sailors uh, on a daily basis in order to get your leading hand rate. As an officer, it's slightly different. Uh, these are the application requirements um, that I got from the Royal Navy website. So you need to be aged between 18 and 39 to begin with. So say, for instance, you didn't want to do an apprenticeship or didn't want to do A-levels uh, and you were, say, 16 or 17, it would be a bit too early for you to join the Royal Navy as an officer. You have to be 18 at least. You need at least 72 UCAS points, which means A-levels, really, or the national equivalent like BTEC or Scottish hires. So you need to put a bit of extra effort into getting those. You also need five GCSEs um, graded nine to four in the new style grading format. So as an officer, you're expected to be a little more educated than a rating um, because there's different type of work you need to do. There's a lot more what we call staff work, a lot more typing, um, a lot more management of people and leadership of people that needs that better education background. Your fitness needs to be reasonable as well. So your body mass index needs to be between 18 and 28. So you can't be too thin, can't be too, can't be too wide. And you need to keep your fitness up. For the application, similar to the rating application, except there's an added step right at the end. So there's the defense aptitude test. You need to sit an interview at the careers office. You need to pass a medical and eye test. You need to keep your fitness up and pass a two and a half kilometer or 2.4 kilometer treadmill. Um, bit of a shock for me when I did my two and a half uh, kilometer treadmill run. Uh, it's a lot quicker than I expected it to be. And I had to do quite a bit of training to, to, uh, to get up to that fitness level. But that's the difference between a civilian and a military person and that the military person would know that their fitness needs to be high. The final one is the Admiralty Interview Board. Now, they've done several versions since I've joined the Navy. Way back when I joined up 10 and a half, 11 years ago, uh, it was a two and a half day test. Now, I believe it's in two parts. One is a pre-recorded interview. So you really need to sell yourself and be the best person that you can be in this pre-recorded interview. Uh, and the extra things they're looking in that interview for you to sell yourself about would be tasks that you've led whether you've done any fundraising, for instance, have you led a small team? Uh, my best example was leading a small team up Scarfall Pike in the Lake District and raising some money uh, for charity for a young girl who had cancer. So something like that, what's going to set you apart from everybody else? And now the great thing about the Sea Cadets is that there's so many things that your units will be getting involved in, whether it's poppy appeal collection at your unit or uh, whether it's summer camps that you can get involved in activities. There are so many different things. And all you have to do is put your hand up and ask your instructors, I would like to do this. Please can I do it? And they'll get you involved. The second part of the Admiralty Interview Board is a team task where you're set a scenario and you need to be able to think of solutions to that scenario. Uh, now, it might be that there are four people in your team and you have to agree on a certain uh, outcome for a task. You all have to agree that, yep, that's the way we want to go. And that's what we want to do. We want to go to this place at this time. We want to take these, uh, these Land Rovers and these supplies, etc. The panel will then see you separately and you can change your answer. So you might be candidate A and as a group, candidates A, B, C and D have all decided to do something. And then you're seen separately by the panel and the panel says, candidate A, would you like to carry out that uh, solution to that plan? And you say, no, sir, I would like to do this instead. And as long as you give good reasons and you've thought your plan out, that's absolutely fine. It's not wrong. You just have to state your reasons. 
Now, because it's a bit more involved uh, and there's more responsibility in officers' shoulders, uh, you'll remember I said the starting salary for a rating is about £23,000. The starting salary for an officer is £31,000. So that's significantly more uh, going into your bank account at the end of the month. Basic training for an officer. Seven months at uh, the Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth and Devon. Absolutely gorgeous place. It's an old, uh, it's over 100 years old now, the college on a hill in Dartmouth, looking down onto the river. People call it Hogwarts because on the other side of the river, there's a steam train uh, that pulls in uh, to the nearby town of Kingsweir. Absolutely gorgeous, stunning setting. And they really do support you in giving a really good rounded um, training. You'll learn all about military history um, all the way through from the early uh, days of military conflict through to big events like World War I, World War II and the Falklands and all sorts of other aspects of military history. You'll be looking at fitness. You'll have regular fitness sessions, including 6 a.m. fitness sessions, which I used to hate. Um, and you'll be fed really well as well. On top of all of that, um, you'll be taught etiquette. Uh, etiquette is really important for an officer because you'll be expected to be able to speak to anyone and have small talk with anyone. So if you at the moment uh, sort of struggle a little bit in striking up a conversation with someone you've never met, they teach you these skills while you're at the college so you can have, uh, you can have guests on board your ship and just about be able to talk about anything. It's a skill that people need to learn mostly. So once you've done your seven months at Dartmouth, you will then go to sea for nine months on the job training in a warship. This bit is really, really important because you need to be professionally accredited as a warfare officer to carry on your job. If you can't pass uh, the assessments at the end of your nine months on the job training, you'll be sent back to sea for a bit more training. Um, but then if you can't pass again, that's your time in the Navy over. It's really, really important that you get uh, what we call your black book. It's a certificate basically to say that you can do your job. That's not to say there's a lot of pressure. Uh, there is a lot of pressure, but it's spread over nine months and you work your way through a task book and the ship's crew is really supportive, particularly the captain and the, uh, the navigating officer, uh, are the two individuals you'll be working with most to gain the skills that you need to go towards those assessments. Now, the ship that you join, whether it's uh, as a rating doing uh, your uh, professional development early on or as an officer doing the on the job training really, really depends on where there is space. So it could be that you're around the UK um, escorting Russians through the English Channel or doing training in the South Coast exercise areas. Or perhaps you might go to the Pacific Ocean and join one of our River Class Batch 2 uh, vessels out there waving the flag uh, and promoting Global Britain. It really depends uh, where there is space. After your nine months training, you'll go and sit some exams and go to the simulator and be assessed. And then hopefully that's you ticked off um, professionally trained. You'll then join a ship as an officer of the watch. Uh, the officer you can see on the left, the sub-lieutenant, uh, is an officer of the watch on the bridge. It's her responsibility to keep the ship safe at sea uh, for periods of uh, four hours at a time. Uh, the only person that she answers to is the captain. You'll notice uh, that the lieutenant commander on the right hand side there is more senior in rank. Now, technically, he should be able to tell her what to do. But because she is the officer of the watch, she can say, no, I don't want to do that. It's not safe. So it's a lot of responsibility, but you're trained up to it uh, over those nine months on the job training. My first time, there, there's a formal way you, you take responsibility for those four hours uh, at a time on watch. And you say the words, I have the ship. Uh, and that's recorded for a voice recorder and it goes in the log. And the first time I said those words uh, was a big moment for me. Once you join the ship as an officer of the watch, uh, you will then work towards the bridge warfare qualification. And that's an extra step. So your professional accreditation as uh, an officer of the watch is uh, recognized across the UK. And the bridge warfare qualification is a Navy uh, qualification that goes on top. And it teaches you a bit more about how ships fight, uh, how we operate helicopters, um, what weapons uh, we have and how we use them, etc. That typically takes about a year. 
So normally two or two and a half years after you start your training as a rating or an officer, you'll be fully up to speed and well on your way to working your way up the ladder. So what can the Navy offer you? That was a lot of information um, and I'll see if I can condense it down to uh, certain bullet points that apply across the spectrum, whether it's the warfare branch you're joining or whether it's uh, as a rating or as an officer. Well, first of all, um, they offer nationally recognized qualifications. Quite often, if you join, for instance, as an engineer rating, uh, you will get put onto an apprenticeship scheme. And when you come out the other end uh, as uh, an able seaman uh, or being able rate grade one, uh, you get an apprenticeship uh, on your CV. So that's really, really good. It's on the job training and you're getting paid for it, which is great. Uh, it's a lot better than other people uh, across the country uh, uh, might have to say. There's also free medical care. Uh, depending on what ship you're on, there might be a dedicated doctor or a whole team of doctors and nurses, and that's free. Uh, if you were to go to uh, an NHS uh, doctor on the high street, for instance, you might be waiting days for an appointment, whereas you can just knock on the door of the sick bay at eight o'clock in the morning and you'll be seen pretty much straight away. Free dental care as well. Uh, my wife often complains that uh, getting a checkup uh, at the dentist is 80 or 90 pounds. It's completely free in the Navy. And again, all you have to do is book an appointment. Free gym equipment. Almost every ship I've ever been on has a gym uh, funded by the Navy. So you don't contribute to it at all. All you have to do is make sure that you're not required on watch or on duty and you can go to the gym. You'll remember from the list of countries on the right hand side of the first uh, screen about me, you can travel the world. Um, that's completely up to you uh, as to what you ask to do. Uh, you can ask to do adventurous training or sports in Germany or Ascension Island or South America. And it's uh, also up to the Navy as to where it sends you as well. You might be really, really lucky and get back to back deployments in the Pacific or the Atlantic or Antarctica. Um, and that over time, uh, that builds up to a big list of countries. And some other ones at the bottom right hand side of the screen as well, all of which are really, really important. And now in today's age, particularly post COVID, I'm going to point out the free pastoral care or counselling. Um, I've had to use that once or twice. Uh, they are chaplains. Um, so uh, on the face of it, they're religious people, but actually they're trained in counselling. I'm not religious in the slightest, and I recognize that there are many, many other religions out there, um, and you have your own views as well. But ultimately, chaplains are there to help you if you need help. Uh, and that's what I've gone to them uh, for in the past, and they are excellent at providing help and asking the questions and giving you the support that you need. When you leave the Navy, which will be eventually, maybe you do a few years, maybe you'll do a whole life career. Uh, there is so much post-service assistance available to you, a number of charities, a number of organizations that will help you out and an excellent free pension as well. A lot of companies say if you join a supermarket or you join a business uh, and you do office work or whatever a civilian company it is, you will have to pay out of your salary into a pension. Now, that probably doesn't mean anything to you at the moment. Uh, you probably don't really care about a pension, but later on, you will. Um, and uh, for it to be a free zero contribution from yourself is excellent. And the benefits you get later when you need, leave the Navy and you start drawing your pension are excellent. It's like getting, well, it is getting paid for not doing work. That just about covers it, I think. I uh, think I've just about uh, covered my allotted time uh, and I've covered a lot of aspects. Uh, is there anything uh, that anybody wanted to talk about? Amazing, thank you um, so much for that. And we do have a, a couple of questions in the Q&A section there. Um, one I've kind of answered, if you want to have a look, um, it was where you could sign up for the Navy when you leave school. Um, I've put a website in, in the chat there and you can look at that and find your nearest career office if, if that, um, um, depending on where you are. And um, we can't really give a, a bog standard answer to that, but generally a career office. Um, so, sort of, we have a, a few more questions here. Um, something specific um is there are there particular universities that are better for being becoming a work worker officer in the navy 
Absolutely okay. not. No, it doesn't matter where you go to as long as it's a, a degree. Um, I got a two one, um, which is relatively reasonable. But as long as you're uh, as long as you pass that degree, as far as I'm aware, um, that's absolutely fine. It doesn't matter which university you've been to. OK, fabulous. Um, does it make an impact? I mean, you mentioned specifically English and maths, but does it matter what other A-levels you get? No, I think they more care that you've um, that you've got the points and you've got the GCSEs and the A-levels. English and maths are particularly important because you need the written skills and you need to be able to do some basic maths as well. And anything else on top of that is an added extra. Um, while we're on the subject and I'm thinking of it, if you have another language as a GCSE or an A-level, you can get paid extra in the Navy uh, with that language if you use it. So, for instance, um, Arabic uh, is very popular in the, in the military at the moment. You can get paid extra if you know Arabic, French or German or whatever it is. So that's a good one to have if you like the languages to pursue it and get it formally recognised as a qualification. Amazing. Yeah. <laughs> is it offers so much doesn't it um is a degree necessary to become a warfare officer or can you achieve it without i don't think so let me just double check i think it was just the ucas points wasn't it um officers entry requirements uh yeah 72 ucas points so as or a levels national diplomas or BTEC. So you don't necessarily need a degree. I had one, um, but uh, no, you don't necessarily need one. It's just the UCAS points thereafter. Fabulous, amazing. Um, looking at the other questions here. Um, what is the Navy's stance on learning or mental health disabilities? We have to recognize, particularly more and more nowadays, that everyone has different ways of learning and different ways of taking things in. Um, and so the Navy will support you if you have uh, if you have uh, learning difficulties to a certain extent. Now, obviously, they can't interfere with your job too much. They have to you have to be aware of them and be able to tackle them. And there is extra support available to you. So similar to exams in school, you might be given extra time to do to do exams, etc. Um, so they have to be sort of manageable. I wouldn't be able to give you a definite uh, definite answer on exactly what they are and, and how we do them, but they have to be manageable and not stop you doing your job, if that makes sense. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so someone's asked, what do, you have, what do you need to do to get a specific career in navigation? That happens automatically, unfortunately, as I found out. Um, so as you join the warfare branch as an officer, uh, your typical career structure will be two jobs as an officer of the watch. So your, your first job will be rel relatively junior. Uh, you're still learning the ropes, still learning how things work, how ships work, how the bridge works. That normally is about 18 months or two years. You'll then move on to a second job as an officer of the watch, and you'll be the senior bridge watchkeeper and it's up to you to kind of keep everyone in check you'll get a lot of new people joining as you were a few years ago um, so it's up to you to kind of show them the ropes the next step after that is as navigating officer so you'll be in charge of the entire bridge team uh, making sure that you're training your people uh, ratings and officers because uh, both ratings and officers uh, work on the bridge uh, and you'll be responsible to the captain for making sure that the ship gets uh, where it needs to go um, you need to pass two courses to get to that level, um, two navigation courses. One is sort of an introduction to navigation and is not that difficult to pass. The second one to get you to the point of being a navigating officer is a lot more intense and you do need those four years of your career behind you in order to pass that course. I found it quite difficult, um, but I did manage to pass it first time uh, after, a, after a fair amount of stress. Um, but yeah, it is manageable if you put your mind to it. So I've just got to get a call. Uh, just give me one second. Um, yeah, keep the questions coming in, guys. Um, really exciting um, and really, really good um, in-depth questions here. So we'll try and get through as, as many of them as we can. Please don't worry also if you think of questions after and um, that's something I do quite a lot um, I think about it after the fact and and remember oh I should have asked that and um, please just email us um, 
if you look on the, the posters on social media or I'll put our email address into the chat and um, drop us an email and we can try and get an answer for you um, if you think of a question after. So I'll pop that in the chat just now. Yep. So I do apologize. Uh, there's some stuff going on board this evening that I just need to take care of. So just give me 30 more seconds and I'll be back to you. No problem. It gives us plenty of time to think of exciting questions. So yeah, hopefully you can all see the, the question that I answered earlier. Um, it's got a link. If you just type your postcode into the little locator thing, you'll be able to find your nearest careers office, um, Navy careers office, and they'll be able to support you through the, the joining process the, and, and guide you through what, what you need to do, etc. Okay, back. Sorry about that. Oh, no problem. Um, where were we at? So um, we have someone who's, who's concerned about is mild asthma a concern or would it is it only an issue if it's severe? Um, I'm not sure. I want to say um, probably the best thing to do would be speak to the careers office and speak to the doctor. Um, some aspects of the Navy, they say absolutely not. So diver, for instance, you wouldn't be able to join at all with asthma history, even if it's just kind of when you were really young uh, and it was a blip. Um, other aspects of the Navy, you might be able to get in. So it's probably best to um, probably best to speak to the professionals about that. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so we have someone who's currently doing A-levels um, earlier. Um, there are schools offering a program that allows them to, to sit the exams early. Um, this means you'll be 17 when you leave school. Um, will that block, will, would you have to wait to join up as a, an officer? Or yes. Yeah. yeah, so you might be able to apply before, but you need to be 18 to join. Fantastic. Well, that gives you a year to go out and, and gain as much experience as possible. Absolutely. So, yeah. <laughs> um, do you have to be an officer to be a navigator? Yes. So you may, uh, in your own time, uh, maybe you like yachting, for instance, you like taking yachts out. So in your own time, you can do uh, maybe RYA qualifications through the Sea Cadets or any other uh, establishment. And you can do sort of navigation in your own time. But to be a Royal Navy navigator, you need to be an officer. Fabulous. Okay. Um, if someone signs up just as, as a rating at 15 years and nine months, how soon would they be able to to join um... oh good question um i think it's at 16 and a half or thereabouts um because we do have under 18s and ships uh, but normally they're only under 18 for a uh, for a couple of months um so probably a year or so would have thought but then there's the added complication because on top of that um you need to, depending on what, what you want to join as, there might be a, a delay. So there might be a backlog of, say, six months or one year or even up to two years in some sort of subspecializations. Um, so you might you you might only join at 18 if you if you apply at 15 years and nine months because that's the backlog for that subspecialization. So uh, I'm sorry, I can't give you a definite on the answer on that one because it changes all the time and it really depends on on who the Navy needs. Um, we've needed for some time engineers. So if you wanted to be an engineer, get your name down, we'll have you. But it might take a long time because we've got a backlog. We need them, but there's a backlog and we need to get through them. Yeah, fantastic. And again, a careers office should be able to give you more information about Yes. Um, and all of that kind of thing, I'm sure. Um, so we've got a question about the degrees that the, that's sponsored by the Navy. Um, if they're sponsoring it, do they dictate the subject or can you choose? Uh, yes and no. So there are areas uh, that you can go into. Um, STEM is very important. I'm sure you've heard of STEM. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so any sort of degree in the STEM area uh, would be considered for engineering, for instance. So as long as you have sort of a, a technical aptitude, you don't necessarily have to have an engineering degree to join the Navy as an engineer. Uh, what they're looking for is that kind of like general aptitude uh, with a STEM subject. So maybe it's mathematics that you're good at, uh, for instance. Now, again, you'll have to look at specific career choices as to what those fields are, but in general, that's a good rule to follow. Um, to get sponsored, so, so I wouldn't have been able to get sponsored to join the Navy as a warfare officer because they didn't need degrees uh, and they're so wide. You basically join, at the time you could join with any degree and now they don't ask for a degree. So uh, you have to look at what job you want to do. Specifics uh, examples would be the medical profession. So if you wanted to join as a medical officer, you put your name down before you start your training and the Navy says, yes, please, we will sponsor you through university to do your medical training. Here is a wage on top of uh, your degree paid for. Boom. Awesome. Amazing. Similar with engineering. So you need to look at those uh, those career fields and what you want to do and then identify a subject that sort of roughly matches and what you enjoy doing. Uh, and that's that's a good start of a 10. Amazing. Thank you. Um, so we have, can you join or switch branches after joining as a warfare officer? How easy is that? They've mentioned specifically naval intelligence. Um. <sighs> difficult um so i'm sure there's an official position on this and i'm sure i'm going to get into trouble uh, for saying this uh, this answer um the careers office will have um certain quotas of branches and sub specializations that they need so for instance as you this is a wild example but if you want to join as a chef and they said no we don't need chefs we need engineers but i tell you what you can join as an engineer and then switch halfway through your training uh, it's difficult to achieve in reality. So you join up as what you want to join up as and uh, and don't let them tell you otherwise. Um, for intelligence, I I'm a little bit out of touch with that branch, but I believe it's now become its own um, specialization. So you will join as an intelligence officer or an intelligence rating. Before, it used to be part of the warfare branch, but I'm not sure that's the case now. I think it's its own. So you have to join as um uh, as that subspecialization. Having said that, there is a certain number of transfers that you are allowed to achieve. So for instance, uh, if I take a colleague of mine was a seaman specialist and he wanted to become a diver as a series of tests he could do in the in the service once he joined the Navy and he then transferred over to becoming a diver, but it is difficult to do. So what I would suggest to you is if you want to do something, join direct as that thing um, uh, rather than sort of going around the houses. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so we've got, what is the Navy's opinion on already knowing drill through the cadets? Uh, it can help. It can hinder. I didn't know anything about drill when I joined up and it's not bothered me. Um, I was the guard officer for a number of uh, events, including Queen Elizabeth II visiting my ship in London. Um, and I didn't really have any specific drill training before I joined the Navy. Um, it will help to begin with. Um, so the uh, the class leader for my first ever week uh, when I was at Dartmouth for my training was a former sea cadet and he knew the drill and he knew what orders to give. But in the long run, uh, it doesn't doesn't really make a difference because everybody is trained to the same level. Fantastic. Um, amazing. So we have, um, how, how much flex do you have to choose where, where you, where you're based? Can you choose where you're based, which naval base you operate out of, or do you just get told? Um, it's a little bit of 50-50, that one. So you can state your preferences. Uh, maybe you're from Scotland and you want to you want to work in Scotland. So you can put on your preferences um, that you want to stay in Scotland. Uh, the Naval Base at Faz Lane, for instance. Um, and once you get into the Navy, you'll develop your connections and you'll find more and more jobs that aren't necessarily advertised or areas that aren't necessarily advertised that you would think, you know what, I want to work in Aberdeen or wherever it is. Um, and you can also state your negative preference. So some place that you don't want to go to. So maybe you don't want to go to Plymouth. So you state that on your preferences. Um, that's not necessarily um, always achievable. They take into account, um, but it, you know, some sometimes they just need someone to go somewhere and they need to make that happen now. So it might be that you take the pain for a few years doing a job in a certain base like Plymouth, 
uh, like I did for a number of years. I was I, I live in the Portsmouth area and there's a naval base at Portsmouth and it would have been nice to have been based there. Um, but I was working for several years on a ship based in Plymouth. Um, and they take that into account and then then your next job might be closer to home. So I'm very lucky now to be based in the Portsmouth area. And so when I'm not busy of an evening, I can go home uh, and see my family, which is amazing. But you just have to remember that on balance, uh, sometimes they just need to put um, someone somewhere. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, so what is the sort of top tier of um, in the sort of pay bracket that you can achieve? in this branch ah, it's, it's not published um <laughs> yeah it's a lot of money um the pay bands are published up to i think captain so four ring captain um so lieutenant lieutenant commander commander captain uh, and then above that um i'm not really sure but i think it's negotiated um so you know that individual for a certain job they'll offer a certain amount of pay but you're talking for captain it's pushing a hundred thousand pounds per year um and then there are you know commodores and admirals above them uh on whatever money they're on uh, as well as their cpa if they go to sea as well so um You'll never be a millionaire in the Navy, but you will you can certainly be comfortable if you want to move up the ranks. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, someone's asked about opportunities to get into sport in the Navy. Yeah, absolutely amazing sporting opportunities. Um, there is a whole list, as long as my arm, of the number of sports um, that are supported by the Navy, from cricket to um uh what's that horse riding sport where it's a bit like golf but on horses um and polo po yeah po like ho polo swimming all sorts of stuff that maybe you've never even heard of basketball uh volleyball um and if you want to get involved obviously it's program dependent to so say if your ship's in the atlantic ocean and there's a competition in in uh france you can't make it okay but in general if you want to go and do sports the navy should make time for you to do that and i've known plenty of people who played rugby or um you know done swimming for the navy etc and there tends to be uh, at least one competition per year into services so you'll uh, compete against the navy raf and army in whichever sport that you fancy doing um they also you're also op offered the opportunity to become a coach so i knew uh somewhere one of my previous navigating officers was the coach for the ladies um navy i uh, know it's inter services sorry hockey team uh, and he was coaching them uh in his spare time so yeah um when you do sports for your service as well so if you play sports for the navy it's considered as a duty as well so say if you play on a saturday and that's supposed to be a day of leave you'll get that day back uh, as a day of loo which is really useful yeah um, god it's, it's so promoted it's sport <laughs> is really good um so someone's asked about if you know anything about being able to join if you have if you're on the autistic spectrum or have asperger's not sure uh and i don't want to commit to an answer on that one because i've not really encountered it i'm sure there is some sort of support but i wouldn't be able to tell you i'm, I'm sorry no worries yeah again career office will likely be able to yeah. help um how easy is it if you join as a rating to move across to to become an officer is it possible or do you have to rejoin no there is a path yeah there is a path absolutely um it generally takes a bit longer um so say if you to join uh from what we call civvy street right so you're a civilian and then you join directly as an officer generally that period is a bit shorter than if you were to transfer as a rating to an officer um however it tends to be better because as a rating, you get to know the Navy, uh, you know the ships, you know how routines work. Uh, and so when you follow that path to becoming an officer, and it's much the same, you still sit the Admiralty interview board, you have to do the interviews, et cetera. It's a very similar process. The problem is that uh, you're in the Navy, so you're doing a job at the time. And the Navy can be quite busy at times as well. So whereas in Civvy Street, it might take you six months, maybe it takes you a year. Uh, when you're when you're in the navy but it's certainly possible i've seen many people do it they get selected and then promoted to officer uh, it's called the upper yardman scheme and if you're above a certain age um, which i can't remember off the top of my head or a certain seniority then it's the senior upper yardman scheme um, and there's a lot of specialist jobs you can go general for example if you went warfare rating to warfare officer you could go general service and do the normal stream that everybody else does like i have 
Um, but it might be that you have some important knowledge, say as a diver or as a mine warfare specialist or intelligence rating. Um, there might be some specialist knowledge and the Navy will in effect create a role for you when they promote you to an officer. Fantastic, um, amazing, thank you. Um, what is the Navy's stance on the LGBTQ plus? Very supportive. Um, now, obviously, we have to be respectful of everyone's beliefs, um, but there have been many uh, people of that background uh, who I've worked with, and it's been absolutely fine. Um, yeah, it's the same as anywhere else in the country, really. We 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 know it's around there, and we support people's um, uh, support support people's backgrounds and stances. Uh, and yeah, if they want to um, be part of a society and sort of wave the flag, so to speak, or if they want to keep it to themselves, that's absolutely fine. Whichever um, whichever stance is yours, you can be whatever you want to be in the navy, uh, and you shouldn't be uh, shouldn't be held back or hindered or bullied or anything. It's, we're very supportive of of everybody. Fantastic and um, excellent news. Um, so are there any rules within the warfare or warfare branch or becoming a warfare officer if by needing glasses? Uh, by needing glasses? Um, yeah. I don't think so. Um, a pilot perhaps, but that's sort of a semi-separate branch. Um, in warfare, you should be okay with glasses. I mean, if, if it's a uh, you know they're really really thick, you know as thick as your uh, as thick as your hand, for instance, maybe maybe you might be looking at very specific uh, roles in the navy. But you know a, a normal set of glasses, I can't see any problem with that. Uh, again, the careers office and the medical uh, medical advice will be the best place to go to. Fantastic. Yeah. Um. So how? Everything that you, you learn in the Navy on through your training, through branch specialism, all of that sounds amazing. How transferable is that to the world outside? Semi-transferable. Um, so the Navy and the military in general, uh, and that's not just single out the Navy, but the military in general has a very specific uh, purpose, doesn't it? You know, in general, we defend the country from uh, threats uh, you know, and the king's enemies, if you want to use those phrases. Um, so we train our people to do a specific job. Now, of course, we've got a broad range of skills, but you know, we need an officer of the watch to be able to do this, this and this. So in some respects, they are equivalent to civilian qualifications. So my uh, bridge officer qualification is roughly transferable to the Merchant Navy. But I'll have to do what we call a conversion course to be able to fully transfer that over. So if I was to leave the Navy tomorrow and want to be a, a merchant ship captain, I can do, but it's going to take a little bit of time to transfer those skills across because the Navy doesn't teach me everything the merchant Navy would want me to. So in this specific example, as a bridge officer, I don't know about loading or um, uh, putting containers in certain parts of the ship. I don't have a formal qualification for that sort of thing, whereas a merchant Navy captain does because they have to know it. In the Royal Navy, you have other people who know that. We've got the engineers who know that. Um, so uh, to answer your question, sort of 50-50, you know, is there on paper, but a lot of the time you'll have to do a conversion course to be able to bring you in line with civilian practices. Yeah, I'm a, I think I'm right in thinking that there are a lot of bases have um, sort of career transition um, block like people, teams yeah. that help with that kind of thing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah, and your your last year of service is considered to be your transition year. Um, uh, there's a lot of other benefits which I haven't, which I haven't not, uh, mentioned um, because it just takes up too much space. But this is a relevant time to bring them up as an example. So you get a certain number of um, credits or money every year uh, when you're in the Navy to put towards education. So I think it's still £175 a year to put towards whatever, as long as it will benefit the Navy. You know, for instance, I could go and do a forklift driver's truck tomorrow because it will benefit the Navy. Because at some point in the future, a ship will want a forklift to move a pallet from here to the ship and I'll be qualified as a driver. So it has to benefit the Navy. Now, in your final year of transitioning from being in the Navy to being a civilian again, that's basically the rules go out the window. You can use that money for whatever you want because it will help you when you leave the Navy. Now, that's £175 for short courses. You also get, depending on how long you've been in the Navy, and I think it starts at about six years and ends at about 10 years, um, you get uh, an increasing level of money towards things like degrees. And it's thousands of pounds. 
eight, nine, ten thousands of pounds to go towards things like degrees. And again, once you're in the service, they have to benefit the Navy. But when you're in that last year and you're about to become a civilian, you can use it on whatever you want. So those are two examples of, of the way that the Navy and the military is supporting you when you leave. And there'll be all sorts of other workshops or uh, maybe they teach you how to build a CV, how to interview for civilian jobs um you know the transition to civilian street is really really important because we need to look after our people before during and after they've served fantastic um, amazing and i think we'll have it just um i think this is the the final question here um is there anything you would recommend to study at college or university to become a navigator is there anything that would help um I don't think so. Just just uh, the one piece of advice I always give to my sea cadets when they come offshore in my ship, <clears throat> excuse me, is to to study what you enjoy. Um, that's what I did in school. I did things that I enjoyed. You know, I, I was interested in psychology. So I did I did some studying in psychology at GCC and A-level. I liked acting. So I did drama. Um, you know, I did what I enjoyed. And ultimately, if you can get paid to do what you enjoy, that's your winning at life. You know, if you want to be a paddle sports instructor and you go out there and you, you study paddle sports and you get your instructor's license and that's what you do for the rest of your life and you're happy, amazing. You're getting paid to do that. As a warfare officer or rating, you don't necessarily need any specific qualifications so you can pretty much do whatever you want because whatever you want will probably meet those UCAS uh, UCAS qualifications as an officer or give you a good background as that rating. Fantastic uh, thank you so much for all your time this evening and um, wonderful presentation and wonderful answers to to the questions here um, so yeah thank you very much for joining us tonight uh, Michael. Thank you very much for having me. It's an absolute honor to have spoken. Uh, hopefully uh, you've all found it interesting. Um, if there are any other questions, uh, I'll do my best to answer them uh, through uh, through the webinars uh, forum. And uh, best of luck in your Sea Cadet careers. And uh, I hope to see you offshore in the Jack Petchy uh, next year. Yeah, amazing. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us this evening. Lovely to have you. Um, we do have more webinars every Wednesday for the, the remainder of the year. So keep an eye out on social media and the portal for those opportunities. And have a lovely rest of your evening, everyone. Thank you very much.